Hey everybody and welcome to our live. This is going to be our embroidery trivia night. I'm so glad you could join us. And uh, before we get started, we got a couple hey people. Oh, here we go. We got a couple people here with us. That is my lovely wife, Jennifer. Jennifer, you want to say hi real quick? You got to scream it out. Hey everyone. Okay, Jennifer is in the house and we have uh, James Deere is over in the corner as well. He'll be assisting you guys on YouTube. And uh, I'm going to see if James will just come over and say a quick little hi in one second. But uh, got a little bit of exciting, uh, but kind of sad news, but good news. I don't really know how to do it. It's, it's very sad for me and very good news for James. And we're excited for him. But James has decided to uh, take a bit of a break from the embroidery legacy. And it might be a permanent break. We don't know. But he is venturing off on his own. And he's going to be uh, doing some exciting stuff. And I'm very, very proud of him because I know he is a, a man with uh, both uh, both vision and discipline. So, James, I just want you to come in here. We we love you, bud. And we are so excited for you to start off a uh, journey. Hey, everybody. Just wanted to say a huge thank you for all of the uh, support the past couple of years. And um, I'm <laughs> super excited to see what uh, the legacy will continue doing without me. So, uh Thank you once again. Okay. Well, I don't know if I can go on, guys, but James, I love you, bud, and I know you're going to be successful. And appreciate it. Yeah, you've been you've been so instrumental to us growing and getting where we are. So thank you, bud. Thank you, and once again, thank you, guys. It's definitely been a uh, fun journey, and I've learned a lot. And you know, chapter may open again sometime. So oh, you never know, thank you guys. Yeah. Anyways, that that's the first thing. Again. Give us uh, some comments, you know, like, I mean, obviously I'm a little sad, but a little happy. And I, 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 Jennifer's telling me there's some hearts there and everything else. So it's, it's one of those, one of those things where with your children, you uh, obviously always wish them the, the best in success. And it was an honor to have James working with us in the family. Uh, and uh, actually, I should also announce right now that I do have a special guest who is joining us. And this is by no means a replacement for James, because it might seem that way. <laughs> but um, as you guys know, we have uh, Ken, Kim, Ken, come on in here. Uh, Ken has joined our team a while back, and uh, he has actually been in the studio for the last week and a half. That's right. Yes. Here. So hello, everyone. How's it going? So we, we're excited about that. We've done uh, weeks uh, of uh, shooting videos, which means that there is just a little bit of content coming out mm -hmm. that we've shot, and we've shot a lot of it together. So we are super excited about that. And uh, I know we have a lot of really good things coming up in April and May and further, but there are some big announcements coming up. That's so right. It is going to be lots and lots of fun. So anyways, Kim's going to play trivia with us tonight. Ooh, I'm, I'm ready. Okay. And you guys, I, I would like it if you guys played as well. So give us, uh, you know, answers, input. Jennifer is off on the side. So she is here to kind of field any questions you guys have regarding the, the answers. We are going to have some, uh, I guess, uh, winners for certain things as well. We'll have our Stitch to Win is happening. And we have a couple of other little announcements later on. I'm but, curious how many people were at the first trivia. Okay. So Jennifer is asking if you were at the first trivia you know, give us a comment, give us thumbs up, hearts, all that kind of, stuff. if you learned anything, uh, give us more thumbs up and hearts. So, you know, that's, uh, and I know, okay. There did, you did you actually learn something? Were you watching last time, Ken? <laughs> well, I was happening. No, last, uh, the last trivia we did. You, did you watch that? No, I didn't get oh. a chance to watch it last. Uh oh, guys, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is the way it works, Ken. We're going to play trivia together. Okay. And we're going to uh, have a bunch of questions, and then we're going to give the answers afterwards. So this is question number one, and we're going to take turns going back and forth. So I'll do oh, one, perfect. you do the yeah, So it. question number one, what is a hooping aid in machine, uh, excuse me, in machine embroidery accessories? So A, is it a software tool for designing custom hoops? B, uh, a device for automatic fabric hooping? C, attachment for creating 3d embroidery effects or d a tool for adjusting thread tension on the fly now i'm pretty sure you you have to have this one because we just shot some videos about mm -hmm. these actually so anyways give us your comments guys and i see a whole bunch of bees that are hitting the screen 
And that is awesome because you guys are exactly right. Good job, guys. Awesome. Now, um, can we actually have the echidna hooping station? And we did talk, I guess, previously. We we did a, a video where Jesse and I were actually at the impression show, mm -hmm. and we got to uh, do an interview um, with Jesse from uh, Hoopmaster and Mighty Hoop, That's which right. is an, a magnetic hooping station. And we have, uh, you know, there is something coming up very, very, very soon. I know I've been saying that for a while, but that is coming, guys. So we love the automation that uh, these hooping devices and these hoops actually have. So yeah. keep your eye because that is just around the corner. So anyways, uh, next one, and this is where you come up. How come you have, you have like the really short question? And <laughs> I had this thing that, okay. Question I totally two. didn't write this, by the way, guys. <laughs> question which type of stitch is commonly used for lettering? Is it A, satin stitch, B, fill stitch, C, running stitch, or D, cross stitch? Okay. And it is probably kind of good that we put commonly used because I think you could use every one of those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And uh, so we have a whole bunch of people. Actually, I see, I see A's all across the board. Mm -hmm. So everybody is saying A, and you are 100% correct on that. Mm -hmm. Now, to expand on this a little bit, what happens if a satin stitch gets too long? Then what should you make sure is activated in your software? Am I to answer yeah. well, or can, should they answer? You, you, can, you guys can answer as well. If you guys know the answer, type it in real quick. But if you are using a satin stitch and the stitch length is getting too long, so what do you do let's say that past happens. seven millimeters what do you do in your software if you can to adjust for that long set mm -hmm. okay and you know the answer to this that's right yeah, okay. a couple of people have already yep awesome oh, very so nice. and the auto split and you guys are 100 percent correct uh just so you know if you don't auto split then your stitches can become a little loopy yep obviously mm -hmm. and if it gets way too long meaning you go over that uh you know 12.1 millimeter commercial maximum what gets activated on your machines oh it just starts doing one stitch stops jumps to the other side one okay. stitch stops you forgot the trim the trim <laughs> it's, it's called it's called invisible embroidery invisible embroidery <laughs> yeah so so that actually can happen and we see that i i know in our our hatch group a lot of times people will call things up on screen mm -hmm. and then they'll they'll put a, a sample on the group and they'll show like the letter a which sewed perfectly going up one side and it oh. hits that corner where the stitch length starts to get longer yeah. and all of a sudden the stitches have disappeared <laughs> and they're like what happened there well that's what happened the stitch length got too long mm -hmm. which is a lot of times why you'd use a fill stitch yeah. and running stitches would be for small lettering you know all that good stuff and a cross stitch i guess you could do a cross stitch letter how do you feel about uh, auto split stitch by the way auto split uh, or auto split satin after seven after seven minutes. yeah i mean i i like that it is uh, an available tool that mm -hmm. is there as a safety net mm -hmm. but i think depending on the application and this is where people uh th this is again just an opinion yeah but we all know that different fabrics react differently to long stitches yes right yeah i mean i can do a longer stitch on denim and it's not going to necessarily have the same detrimental effects than trying to do a longer stitch on a t-shirt material, mm -hmm. right? Because one's going to pull more than the other. So I think that there are rules for embroidery, mm -hmm. but the rules change yes. all the time. What, what do you think? I would say it really depends on the style that I'm going for when it comes to the design. Some people really like the satin stitch, even if it's split. Really long, yes. Yeah. Uh, some people prefer the, uh, the tatami, so it really depends on... Yeah. who who it is for which is who why it's for. who it's for that's right so i guess that's where like digitizing can never be perfect because you can always have different types uh, or true. different styles yeah and it's yeah. kind of funny because i always get a little cringe jennifer when we whenever i see hear somebody say perfect in embroidery it, it, i always get a little cringe and get get i get a little nervous because uh when i was much much younger and i started my digitizing house we actually had a a punch house they called it in those days because we didn't call it digitizing i called it punch perfect punch perfect yes and i learned early on that you should never use the word perfect in a company name <laughs> because you set yourself up you know people expect perfection and you do your best i mean we all do our best but no matter how long you've been doing this because i've been at it 40 years you've been at it for how many years three years three years three, okay yeah, yeah. so there's a little bit of a gap there just a tiny bit but <laughs> i never stopped learning even after 40 years yes. and you're going to have the same thing right yes so, that's right yeah. awesome okay so question number three 
Uh, what does the term run stitch commonly refer to? A, a stitch used for lettering. B, a stitch that fills a design. Uh, C, a decorative stitch with loops. Or D, a stitch that outlines a design. So commonly the term run stitch, what does it refer to? And this one is uh, probably, it could be answered in many ways in, in reality. I was going to say, that's a pretty tricky one. It's a tricky one. Yeah. And I don't think there is a 100% right answer here. Mm -hmm. It might be more of a preference, but it is as most, most people I saw do D. Um, whenever I think of a run stitch, I either think of a traveling stitch. Yes. Meaning like a, a stitch that travels from one area to the other. Mm -hmm. A lot of underlay would be yeah. a run stitch. But a stitch that outlines designs, when I think of a run stitch and I think of detail in designs, yes. a lot of times that detail is uh, kind of, especially if it's fine detail, mm -hmm. outlined with a run stitch as opposed to a... Those satin. smaller designs, those smaller. fine details is usually a stitch that has the outline. Yeah. So. And, and I, I've seen some of the stuff that you've done because uh, you have some really cool designs where you've done... Uh, like statues mm -hmm. and more artistic stuff. Yeah. And you use a lot of run stitches. Yes. And it's pretty fun. <laughs> and, and you've also become our doodler expert. I mean, oh. you've been teaching a lot of stuff on the doodler. One of our experts, I should say, because we do have a lot of people that, yes. and that's one thing I love about the doodler is you're capturing each person's in, individual artistic mm -hmm. style. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think there's any one way to use the doodler because even though I assisted in creating the tools for the doodler, I know that I'm not nearly as talented as most of the people who are posting in our doodler group, which that's a good plug for the doodler group, but yeah, that's <laughs> but, right. But uh, the doodler, what is the main artistic stitch? The main, I mean, the single stitch, the run stitch. The yeah. Run stitch. The yeah, yeah that's, stitch. I love that one. I got to say, by the way, I have been hopping in and out in the doodler community. I don't know how many of you are here, but I love all the designs that you've been creating. So please keep sharing them more because they are so beautiful and I can't wait to see what else you guys create with awesome. Them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. And this, oh, good. You got a longer one now. Okay. Go uh, ahead, yeah. it's <laughs> funny. <laughs> okay. Question. What is the purpose of the tie off or lock stitch in digitized embroidery? Hmm. This is a pretty good one. A, secure the beginning and end of a design. B, add extra texture to the design. C, create a gradient effect, or D, change thread colors seamlessly. Awesome. And uh, we probably could have expanded on that question a little bit mm -hmm. because it should have been what is a tie in or tie off, yes. you know, because there is both. Yep. There's a tie in and a tie off. And I see most people are answering and they're answering this one. This one, I don't think there is multiple choices. No, it's, this it's, one is definitely. Yeah, it's pretty much uh, A. Now, do you have anything specific you'd like to say about a tie-in and a tie-off? Anything that you've kind of learned along the way? I would say, well, first of all, I love the, that on the Design Doodler, it has been pretty amazing how you can turn off that function. So depending on whether you, you are more of a beginner digitizer or a more experienced one, you really get the ability to turn off all of those functions, which is really nice. I like, and I try my best with, if you guys have seen the tutorials, when I'm using one single color, I try to do one tie in and one tie off, and then everything else, it's always running, unless I necessarily have to do a jump stitch. Mm -hmm. So I just think it saves a lot of time, and uh, you you remove more of those uh, tails on the back of the design. Yeah, and, and the, the bad side is if you ever create a design that doesn't have a tie in, what can happen is the thread can come out of the eye of the needle very easily mm -hmm. and become unthreaded, which wastes time because you have to rethread the machine. The tie off is really important because if you don't have a tie off in a design, yeah. you're in trouble because that little you know piece that you see start to unravel, mm -hmm. if you end up you know pulling on it, You'll start to unravel the leg. I used to, and I haven't told this story in many years, but I used to tell this when I did events uh, many years ago. And I think it was Continental Airlines. Have you ever heard of a uh, Continental? Air I feel like from a movie. Okay, <laughs> okay, guys. Now I'm starting to feel it here. Uh, but they were actually acquired by United and all that kind of stuff. You've heard of United? I have. Okay, yes. Okay, good. That's from okay. a movie too. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. And it, anyways, uh, Continental used to have on the back of their headrests. It was embroidered. 
Mm -hmm. They had please fasten seatbelt, you know, well okay. seat, well seated, yeah. right? And I, it always killed me because I would be on a lot of planes. I did a lot of events. Mm -hmm. And I always saw that the person who had that contract on like 90% of the flights, they didn't tie out properly. Oh. And there was always a thread hanging there. And I, as an embroiderer, I have a responsibility to pull that thread. <laughs> okay, that was my responsibility. And I'd always be like, see, very carefully. So I get like, please unfashion your CB or mm -hmm. something like that, you know? So <laughs> anyway, that, that was, um, but yeah, if you don't tie out properly, there can be issues and there are different, I guess, ways of tying in and out, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You can tie it in, in a single direction, mm -hmm. which you might do on a thin object, mm -hmm. right? If there's a thin satin stitch, but if you're tying in on a fill, a larger area, you might actually do like a triangle a triangle fill. Okay? Yeah. Because you usually tie ins are, uh, hold better when you have both X and Y movement on the frame. Okay. okay? Yeah. And if you're tying out, usually tie outs are usually in the same direction of a stitch, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And usually I also try to tie out, not on the bottom of the letter I, okay. like if, if you're going to tie out, I usually try not to have my end point right at the bottom of an object mm -hmm. because then it ties out at the bottom and you can visually see that it will sort the letter. Yes. But if you tie out one or two stitches into the object, okay. it goes into the stitches and disappears. Mm -hmm. You're almost like hiding it behind the You're other hiding stitches. You're hiding it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, now, how, how did you do, I'm assuming you did it manually. In the old days, we did everything manually. Was it always a triangle for the tie-in? Uh, it was that? always a triangle for the tie-in when we had the space. Mm -hmm. And uh, tie-outs 99% of the time were you know, straight stitches going back and forth, okay. but not at the bottom of an object. Mm -hmm. You know, these are little things that you, we might, uh, the software does it automatically now. And mm -hmm. I, by all means use the software, but I used to do things manually and it was a bit of a transition for me to trust that the software knew what it was doing. Yeah. But I still yeah. changing. Jennifer has a question. Yes. Does hatch automatically tie in and tie out? The question was, does hatch automatically tie in and tie out? Yes, it does. They are usually set as a default, the will common hatch platform. Most software that I've seen being, you know, Floriani and, and Brilliance and all those do have it set as a default for tie-ins and tie-outs mm -hmm. because that's kind of a foundational thing in embroidery. As Ken said, sometimes you might want to turn it off in mm -hmm. certain circumstances yeah. when creating objects. And if you haven't downloaded the, the Doodler trial, there is, I like to call it like autopilot, but you're in safe mode. Mm -hmm. You know, like for somebody who's never done any design creation, the doodler will let you play and let you sew stuff with security that it'll still run pretty well. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's because of the autopilot features that are in there. Mm -hmm. But if you know how to fly, you can turn <laughs> the autopilot off. Yep. And that's where you kind of get, that's why you want to watch more of Ken's videos because he's going to teach you how to fly. That's right. right. So awesome. <laughs> I'm also learning myself how to fly even more. So we might, you know, have a little yeah. turbulence, and, but it's been Well, fun. that's okay. Cause <laughs> this has been fun for me because even as an educator years ago, I realized that, you know, I started teaching after 10 years of being a production puncher. Mm -hmm. And when I first started teaching in the commercial industry, and that's almost 30 years ago now, mm -hmm. I think, or 25, almost 30 years ago, I had to take a step back. Because after you do something repetitively for a long time, mm -hmm. you almost forget where you started from. So working with you, I mean, you're well past the learning curve, but us yeah. working together again, yeah. it's kind of fun because I feel like I'm I'm learning stuff because mm -hmm. I'm taking, you know, I'm yes, Jennifer. Amy's asking, when you clip the tails on the back of the of a design, will that cut the lock stitch? When you clip the tails on the back of the design, will that cut the lock stitch or unravel it? No, as long as you don't cut like really, really close, you know, and I mean, yep. it will lock it. Uh, Ken is kind of trademark for his unique way of getting rid of tails. <laughs> what do you do, Ken? I just set him on fire. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so, and we need a video on that. I, you know, I've, I, I thought it was really cool the first time I saw it mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to kind of, kind of do that myself, mm -hmm. but I think I need you to give me a class on how to that properly. That sounds good. I, I, I have learned myself from my previous mistakes where I did burn the back of a sweater because I was like, oh, you know what? This is not burning the thread. So I just left it on a little too long, too long. burnt the thread, burnt the sweater. Yeah. So I learned my lesson to if you guys if, if you ever see the reels that we're making and I show that little tool. It's like one, two seconds max, not even, and uh, then get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you should do a little tutorial. I maybe I should. Yes, yes yeah. that's right. <laughs> if you'd like to see a tutorial, tutorial of Ken burning the back of a, an embroidered item, 
uh, give us some thumbs up or hearts, please, because that'll that'll let us know. A fire emoji, if you guys have. <laughs> yeah. Fire. Yeah. So, anyways, question number five: uh, What role does the density setting play in digitizing embroidery designs? Okay. Does it is it adjusting the thickness of the fabric, controlling the spacing between the stitches, determine the numbers of colors used, or add shine to the thread? Mm. Which one? A, B, C, or D? I think most people will probably get this, what uh, density, because density, I always I always try to explain it for people who are just starting in the simplest of ways. Density is like the space between your fingers, mm -hmm. right? If your fingers were stitches, if it comes closer together, it's more density. Yeah. Further apart, it's less density, yeah. right? So given that, it would be B, controlling mm -hmm. the space between the stitches, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have anything to add about density? I would say it also depends on the size of the design. Yeah. That's very important. The density depends. Like if you're going to be doing a super fine design, then you don't want to have as much density because then you're going to get in trouble. Stitches will go on top mm -hmm. of each other. So it just, can also yeah. depend on fabric type. Yes. Because yeah. a lot of fabrics will uh, vary the amount of density. You mm -hmm. know, some fabrics require more density. Uh, some require less, like toilet paper <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, leather, things that, you know, yes. don't, aren't woven. Uh, I will also add, and this goes almost beyond the basics a little bit, because uh, Hatch does have something called uh, Auto Fabric Assist, mm -hmm. which means that if you set your fabric uh, tight before you start digitizing, okay. it will uh, adjust the density according to that fabric type. Okay. okay. And it will also adjust the stitch length of the underlay. Mm -hmm. So if it's leather, it'll make the stitch length longer because you want less penetrations in your underlay on leather because it doesn't have any fiber to okay. it, right? It'll also adjust the pull compensation on the design based on the fabric. Mm -hmm. So it does that all of that automatically, which sounds like a dream come true. But what people don't realize is it doesn't take into account the amount of detail and layering mm -hmm. that you're doing. Because yes. if you stack a color on top of a color on top of a color, it will know to use the same density on each color when in reality, if you put three or four layers of density on something, what happens? Then you get the bulletproof. The bulletproof. You get stitch <laughs> intense. So, so there's always these things that will change, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Jennifer. Anne is asking, what stabilizer is best for dense embroidery designs to <clears throat> avoid puckering? Uh, which stabilizer is best for dense embroidery designs to avoid puckering? I would say that that has uh, a few answers. Number one, how you hoop it. Hooping it properly and securely will help to aid in that. Uh, probably just as much as the stabilizer. It depends on the fabric type that you're using. Mm -hmm. You know, right. whether yeah. you're going to be using a thick, let's say, cutaway or a lighter weight cutaway. Like a no-show mesh is a much lighter weight cutter cutaway than a 2.5 ounce standard mm -hmm. cutaway. Uh, but no-show mesh actually has a heat press grid, which makes it stable in both directions. And then you have, but let's let's say this, if I use a standard 2.5 ounce cutaway on a shirt like this, which is thin, yep. or a t-shirt like yours, you're going to see a stabilizer shadow. That's right. You'll yes. actually see a line where the stabilizer is. So even though in the best case scenario, using a thicker stabilizer would be better, mm -hmm. you can't because of the nature of the fabric that you're applying it on. And then you ask yourself these other questions, which is, can I potentially use a fusible stabilizer or interfacing to help give even more stability? Because the one thing people don't realize is a lot of the times when you have puckering, it's because your stabilizer, which is here, is holding securely on one side of the hoop that it's touching. And then your other side of the hoop presses down with the fabric and it's touching the other side of the hoop. So your stabilizer might be nice and secure, but your fabric is doing the slipping yep. you know what I mean? it's moving it's moving differently so uh there's no easy answer to that it really depends on the design how it's hooped the stabilizer the thickness of the fabric and just keep watching our videos because we're going to be we've been working on a lot of those things we have actually funny enough we we did talk a little bit about something like that today so you guys will see those videos coming out soon yeah. and that is what you just mentioned so make awesome. sure you guys Keep watching on like the YouTube channel because a lot of them will be coming out very soon. Jennifer, another question? Yes. What's the common density of lettering? 
Uh, the common density of lettering, again, that depends on the fabric that you're using, but the standard density that I've seen over and over again is usually 0.4 millimeters of space between stitches, okay? Which means that it's 0.4 millimeters of space between each line of stitch. Mm -hmm. But you also, there, there's kind of uh, magical things that happen in most software programs. Not all of them, but most of them. And uh, Wilcom is one that uh, has done this for many years. They have something that's called incremental density. And a lot of people don't even know what happens. If you take a object that's shaped like a triangle, so you have that point at the top. Mm -hmm. And if you put a, two points at the very tip of that triangle and then to two points at the very bottom of the triangle, mm -hmm. and you measure the spacing of the stitches at the very top and then the spacing of the stitches at the very bottom. Okay it will actually have less spacing between the top because it's closer together. Okay. And as it goes down, mm -hmm. guess what happens? It the spacing to, gets closer yeah. together. So in the old days, in the Shifley days, we used to have, we used to draw our designs on paper, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And we had these little, uh, these things that uh, for density that look like uh, pattern wheels that okay. and you might not even know what that is. If you guys, if any of you know what a pattern wheel is, write it in the comments or put your hands, yeah, in, put the your hands in the air. Okay. But <laughs> we would actually mark that on the paper and there was spacing between the pattern wheels and we would make sure we used less density on thin stitches okay. and more density on wider stitches. Okay. So it really, you know, it gets, it gets a little more complicated and that's where I do love software. Because software is pretty intelligent at this stage. You know, the thinking that we have to had to do 40 years ago mm -hmm. almost happens automatically now. Yeah. I see in the comments that somebody said they've been using T-pins. T-pins are great. Magnetic hoops are great. Uh, we have a whole bunch of tips. Watch our videos coming up because we just covered all that stuff. That's right. So, yes. And Jennifer, you're going to have to give us a little eyes on time because we, I don't think we're going to get through all the questions here. We, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. We're, we're chit chatting too <laughs> much. If, yeah. <laughs> if, if anybody thinks we're talking too much, uh, which they put, no, okay. So, anyways, uh, put your hands in the air. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of fun because Ken and I get to discuss these things. I hope you're having a good time. But even if you're not, we're having a good time. We're okay. having a great time. Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, uh, is this your turn or mine? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, question What is the purpose of the trim or cut command in digitizing? A, adjust the thread tension, B, remove excess fabric, C, cut jump stitches between designed elements, or D, add a decorative border to the design? And the answer is, everybody? What are you guys going to get? Put your, put your, I, I see one, two comments there. Okay, now they're coming in. <laughs> and you know what? I see they're all pretty much right. Yeah. Get it? See? Okay. Anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they, it is to cut the stitches between design elements. And... Uh, this is, uh, and I think, you know what, if I'm boring you, I can't imagine how bored you've been over the last week because in between all our videos, I've been sharing the old day stories. I love it. Actually, guys, comment down if you would like to hear John talk to me more about this story because I have been just mesmerized listening to everything and just learning all about the industry. Yeah. He, well, he, le he learned about crazy things about machines that didn't have trimmers in the old days, you know, like, and, <laughs> yeah. and that's, you know, that's the way it was. I mean, we had Shifley machines that had absolutely no trimmers and we had multi-head equipment that had no trimmers. Mm -hmm. And you really had to think about how you were creating things when you had to trim everything by hand. And if any of you have a, have a machine, have been doing this for a while and you had a home machine or a machine that didn't have trimmers and you had to sit there, and actually oh. pick everything out with scissors let us know in the comments because it wasn't you know it took a little bit of the joy factor mm. out of it you know as far as I'm to concerned. manually trim to may have to manually trim between every object and especially if the digitizer was passing over other objects and stuff so if yes. you forgot to trim something all of a sudden you got there and it was covered over and you'd have to start picking through oh. it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and my wife my beautiful wife jennifer has been at this a while as well do you remember in the old days watching machines jen and having to pick out all the, yeah. So anyways, Bob and changes, all that good stuff. So <laughs> anyways, uh, number seven, what does the term stitch direction for, uh, refer to? A, the order in which colors are applied. B, the orientation of stitches in relation to the design. C, the speed of which the machine operates. Or D, the choice between satin and fill stitches. So put your comments there, guys. I see a couple of them there. Most people, yep, they're just coming in. And this one, 
I think majority of the people have this one right, and that is the orientation or the direction of the stitches in relation to the design. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you have to say about this? Anything? Because I've got something to say about everything, so I'll let you talk. Sorry. What? Um, no, <laughs> let's hear what John has to say yeah. about it. I'm actually interested. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, what I have to say about this is this is what I love about embroidery as an art. Mm -hmm. is that we're not dealing with print we're not dealing with ink not that there's anything wrong with that but that we have a physical medium <laughs> of thread that reflects light yes that's so right. yeah. you can have a design and by simply changing the angles and the direction of stitches mm -hmm. the light hits the thread and creates different hues of colors and dimension and building underlay up to increase the loft i mean there's there's just so many beautiful things that you can do with embroidery thread yeah and direction yeah. is a big part of that that's right yeah. yeah it's uh it's actually crazy how even the same color you can take it and put it into two different angles and it'll mm -hmm. give you different shadows which will look like two different colors, colors. which yeah. is amazing it would be nice to actually create a tutorial with just one single color and, and see then how see how many yeah views you can change <laughs> yes jennifer right. Trini is asking why not a why not a uh she, Jenny is asking why not the order in which colors are applied. So this the term stitch direction. Uh, the term stitch direction refers to in embroidery the direction of the stitches within objects. Mm -hmm. The order in which colors are applied that is actually more of a term which is uh, referred to as mapping, right? Mm -hmm. How you seek yeah. or sequencing. Sequencing. Okay, yeah. sequencing or mapping. How you sequence the colors in the order for the design to be production friendly. And that is another question that I do if we have time. I have some bonus material, which we might not get to, but I have some bonus material. Okay, Jennifer's, Jennifer's uh, just so you know, behind the scenes, I'm getting this. What does that mean, Jennifer? <laughs> yeah, something to say about everything. <laughs> It could also be uh, the... Um... Oh, let's see, look who's talking now. <laughs> <laughs> One last thing, guys, really quick. It can also be known as stitch angles. Yes. So that's yeah. that's the way in which I normally say it yeah. is stitch direction, or, stitch angles. Or inclination. Inclination. Inclination and... points or directions. So there there is multiple words for all of them. Uh, this was yours, wasn't it? I think that was yours. No, I think this one's Okay, yours. it is mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, get ready. When digitizing for high pile fabrics such as terry cloth or fleece, what adjustments should be made to ensure the embroidery design sits on the surface without sinking into the fabric? Very nice question. One, use a longer stitch length for a raised effect. Two, apply a water soluble stabilizer on top of the fabric. Three, opt for a lighter thread weight to reduce thread sinking. Or four, utilize a topper stabilizer to keep stitches on the fabric surface. Okay. Well, uh, I think this one might have been a little misleading because two and four are very, very mm -hmm. similar. Yes. Right? And I think this one does actually, in my opinion, have two answers to mm -hmm. it. Okay. I see people are kind or of... Or maybe four is a tricky question. Yeah, four could be a tricky question. But I, I do definitely think that uh, number... Uh, well, what would you say first? You know, you go first. Well, it looks like everyone's saying two or four, but yeah. I definitely agree with that too, because water soluble stabilizer will keep it on top above everything else. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think that uh, we probably should have used the word topper mm -hmm. instead of stabilizer. Yes. Because usually stabilizers go on the bottom, right? When you say mm -hmm. stabilizers, toppers, water soluble toppers, or there is a trade uh, product called Solvi. Mm -hmm. You know, that's actually a, a, a topper. Uh, those ones definitely help to keep the pile uh, down on, on those types of items. Mm -hmm. But I think number one also has quite a bit of merit really? with regards to uh, the uh, uh, digitizing of a, d a design. Okay. I usually try to make sure that my underlay mm -hmm. on, you know, terry cloth or fleece is actually a little bit longer. Okay. Because shorter stitches sink in, mm -hmm. and that will not effectively reduce coverage mm -hmm. on my underlay. Okay. So that's one thing I would do. Also, I try to make sure that I keep my stitches as long as possible, and I try not to use fills because fills have a tendency to sink down and like sort of mat down the terry cloth mm -hmm. where long satins give more of a rich look it's almost like it sounds like you're building a roof on top of yeah. the terry cloth yeah. right so so this one could have many answers mm -hmm. as well and uh jennifer and i, I remember years ago we used to run uh, in the 
night shift a lot of times when people wouldn't show up or on weekends, Jennifer and I would fill in. Do you remember doing all of those orders for Crabtree and Evelyn, Jennifer? It was the Crabtree and El what's that? All those robes. Those robes. And if you, I mean, Crabtree and Evelyn, have you ever heard of them? I have not. Yeah, they, they, they're still around. They make really high end like bathroom accessories and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we, for many years, this is like back in probably the 90s, right, Jen? It would have to be the 90s. Yeah. Okay. But we did robes, just beautiful robes with metallic. And it was oh, all metallic, like metallics. Yes. And, and, and we did slippers. Remember the slippers? So anyways, it was uh, cool, but we really had to be careful how we digitize them, especially with metallic threads. And you want them to look, you know, rich mm -hmm. you know, and almost like they're lifted. So that's how you learned the tricks for metallic thread. By quite doing quite the a bit of it. We did, we did so much metallic. Uh, yes. David Jennifer. is asking with that question, what about doing a knockdown stitch? Yep, knockdown works out really well as well. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping in mind though that, uh, let's put it this way, for the Crabtree and Evelyn designs that we did, part of the appeal of it was that it looks so rich on the terry cloth mm -hmm. that it almost looked 3D. Remember that, Jen? Like it just looked really rich. A knockdown would knock down most of the pile around the stitches that are being created. Mm -hmm. So it would probably give you clearer definition on small objects, but I think it would take away from the richness of something moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I, again, yeah, that's, that's a great, who's who actually commented on it? Lynn, great, great suggestion, Lynn. I think that there is always an embroidery exception to every rule based on what you want the end product to you know, look yeah. like or achieve. Shelly actually wants to know uh, what is knockdown stitch. Okay. A knockdown stitch. It is, um, <laughs> It's a, it's a, uh, I, I think there's a software company that has uh, like uh, uh, trademarked the term uh, knockdown, mm -hmm. but uh, I was doing knockdown stitches 35, 40 years ago before it was ever a function in a software program. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, Wilcom calls it a, like a, well, we called it a hatch smash. There's other terms for you know like it basically just is a stitch that presses down the pile in the terry cloth okay and we traditionally in the commercial industry called it a knockdown stitch mm -hmm. that would give us a stable surface for doing detail mm -hmm. and things not sinking in we should call it a ko stitch K hey, KO. yeah a knockout <laughs> <laughs> or kd that would be yeah. that would be like uh, mac and cheese. No, sorry. Okay. So um, yes. Yeah. So anyways, it was number four. After all that, it was number four, which is essentially like number two, but number one has a bit of an application mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So we are into bonus time, and um, I have a, a few minutes, so Jennifer's not going to yell at me yet. But here's my question: How uh, how much can you resize an embroidery design? Because we get this Ooh. all the time. Okay. What do you think, Ken? I'm going to let him answer. I think it, well, it depends. That's the right answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. depends on the digitized file itself. Yes. It, it, there's a lot of factors. I see 10, 20%. I see a lot of things. The, the truth <laughs> is, I see, you know, I, I, the truth is there is no one correct percentage or answer mm -hmm. because you have a design, an embroidery design, which could be an expanded format, like a DST or PS file. That's right. That essentially is uh, a file that sees X and Y movement and it is stitches. Mm -hmm. And if you take that file, even though some software will convert to objects, it mm -hmm. takes that stitch file, reads it in converts it to objects and then tries to recalculate it it never does it as well as the native file that was yes. created within the native software mm -hmm. so the answer is there's no one right answer because if you're dealing with a minimum stitch width on a design mm -hmm. you can't make it smaller yeah if you're dealing with a design that already has really long stitches <laughs> You can't make them much bigger. That's right. But if you're dealing with a design that's kind of in the medium, mm -hmm. you have a much larger, you know, scope of how much you could resize it. Yeah. And if you have the EMB file, which is a native file within Hatch or Wilcom, and you have that software or the native file of Floriani or in Brilliance and it was digitized, then you can go into all of those original objects and you can change the properties. The properties. Right? That's right. Yeah. So, so I was going to say about 20 inches, but yeah, you know, you know and I have taken designs that have <laughs> been small and I've made them into jacket bags. Yeah. Did I have to edit them? 
Yes. The like satins. The satins, those... the push and pull, yes. the overlaps. I mean, so there, there is a lot of different attributing factors, and there's really no one answer to mm-hmm. that question. Okay, number 10. Uh, why do some designs have so many color changes? Mm. In them? And I get this all the time because if you go to our signature <laughs> series or you get some of my artistic merit designs or you get some of my designs that are like really, really big and have a lot of detail in them, there can sometimes be like 43 colors. And yep. People do not like that. A lot of them repeat themselves. Black might be used five times in a row, mm-hmm. like not in a row might be used five times within the design, mm-hmm. but there is a ton of color changes. And uh, why do you think that is? Why? I think it has to do with the fact that you're trying to avoid the design from being shifted and for the placement to be as perfect as possible. possible. So although it might suck for people who don't necessarily have a bunch of needles, you're still going to create a much better result by having those proper color changes and mm-hmm. the placement of the design itself. Uh, that was a great answer, and uh, I, I got I got to be totally honest with you guys. Uh, we try to digitize the design to be production friendly mm-hmm. and to give the best registration possible in the worst case scenario. Which means that I, I wish all of you only embroidered on denim jackets from this point forward. <laughs> my life or, or on felt. I mean, my life would be perfect if all you ever embroidered on was denim and felt right. from this. But I know you're not going to, mm-hmm. right? There's T-shirts, there's toilet paper. They, I mean, there's so many things. And you have to try to create designs that will work adequately well on multiple applications mm-hmm. and on people who have a single needle machine, Yes, which the hoops aren't as industrially strong as the commercial hoops. Mm-hmm. And the stepper motors don't have the same accuracy or, you know, or durability mm-hmm. in a you know a home machine that you would have in a ZSK or a Tajima machine. That's, you know, what I mean? yeah. like it, there's there's a lot of contributing factors. So yes, we do have extra color changes to try to promote better registration mm-hmm. in very detailed designs. Mm-hmm. Um, the worst thing that can happen is uh, there's some software programs, and I'm sure you know this, where you can actually bring in a design that has 40 colors and you can color sort. Right. right. Yes. The, the software will automatically readjust everything for you mm, really i yeah. didn't know that actually yeah, yeah it, it'll take those 40 colors and turn it into a 10 color design Ooh, but how does it look at the end terrible <laughs> that's that's so then we the, don't need to talk about yeah, it we don't, we don't need to but well, we do need to talk about it because people do that all the time yeah oh. and then and then they email us and say this design that i got from you guys it really sucks because it doesn't you know nothing lines up and then the first question, Leanne, who we love, Leanne, I hope you're you're watching the replay, but Leanne does our support with our customers and she's incredible. And she gets phone calls, all uh, not all the time, but a lot of times with people being really angry mm-hmm. because the design didn't work. Mm-hmm. And then she finds out usually very quickly that it's because they went in and did something to try yeah. to make it better. What I'm so. assuming it does is it grabs the color order and it switches it up so it's the least color changes, but exactly. then they're not all, they're not thinking about the, the uh, you know, when you're tra- traveling on the stitches so it's yeah. like that stitch may come on top of like another one yeah and the registration's off afterwards yes. and yeah. all kinds of bad things okay. are happening so yeah that's what i now this is the last bonus question so jennifer i might actually make it on time i think i'm still within the window okay yeah i, I haven't gotten one of these in like almost 10 minutes <laughs> so that's good uh i love you babe <laughs> Jennifer and I actually just celebrated our 35th anniversary. Yep, so 35 years married. Congrats. And our 40th anniversary for going out in March as well. So we are, we're still up Aww. on that. Yeah. So anyways, um, anyways, uh, question 11, how small can I embroider lettering? Cause we just did our big lettering sale and it's kind of funny cause we did our, our ESA font sale and I've created a lot of fonts over the mm-hmm. years and we have like almost a thousand on our site. And now I noticed you know, there's a lot of hype about lettering and everything and uh, small lettering. We did one YouTube video. I don't know if you've watched it. I did I have, okay, I with have. the tiny, tiny yes. two and a half millimeter letters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do really, really tiny lettering. Okay. Mm-hmm. How small do you think you can go with lettering? Ken? Again, I would say it depends <laughs> on the needle size, on the thread size, yeah, and on the, I guess, on the fabric too. Yeah, and you forgot the most important thing. Wait, which is? The font itself. The font itself. Yeah. Okay. Because some <laughs> fonts are friendlier for small lettering or mm-hmm. embroidery and others aren't. You know, a lot of, a lot of 
very detailed or script fonts mm -hmm. or fonts with very thin, uh, you know, stroke weight, you know, like the, you know, they, it's very, uh, or sorry, very thin stroke weights, not mm -hmm. thick. Uh, if you already have a font that's extremely thin, mm -hmm. then you can't make it two and a half millimeters because yeah. it's just going to sink into the fabric. Right. Or if your font has in the uh, open areas, like the centers of O's and E's and, you know, things like that, or, or uh, an A, you have that small area in an A. Mm -hmm. If the width or the amount of space inside that A is already really, really tiny, mm -hmm. then you can't make a small font out of it. So usually when I digitize a font, I'll bring the font in and I try to determine, usually in my, my software, I'll bring the font in as whatever it is, true type or whatever artwork I, I get it in. And I will right away start to scale the entire alphabet to see what I feel a safe minimum is. Mm -hmm. And I gauge that the creation of that font off of the minimum size. Okay. And then to ensure that it always to works. Ensure that it works at that. Interesting. And yeah. that's why a lot of our fonts, you'll see it says, you know, uh, glory 10 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, you know, uh, whatever, whatever the name of the font is, some will be four millimeters, some will be 10, some will be 25. It depends on that minimum that I determined would be best for stitching. I see. Yeah, because we're not using ink, we're using thread. Right? That's right. So everything has to translate into yes, thread. Yes, that's right. So uh, anyways, uh, anything else to add about lettering? I want to say something about lettering, and that is that I've never actually used fonts myself. I, always created your I've own. always just imported like I've like, got like a thousand of them for you. To that's use. Okay. so guys, <laughs> there's going to be more fonts tutorials coming out soon because I feel like once I get my my hands on the library of fonts, it's game over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so wow. that's happening soon, guys. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so anyways, that is. Oh, I guess I have one more question, uh, and then we have to Ooh, move on. Yeah. Uh, question: Hooping or floating? And this one we're not going to go into a lot, but this is more of a survey. And if you let us know right now, do you prefer to hoop your embroidery and your stabilizer securely in a hoop, or do you prefer to float your designs on top of the stabilizer? Mm -hmm. Because I know this is something, you know, commercial users will usually always say, you know, I would never float anything, but we do a lot of in the hoop projects and we do a lot of uh, techniques, you know, like you want to embroider on toilet paper. You can't hoop toilet paper, you know, and you have to float your toilet paper mm -hmm. on certain things. So I, I'm interested because I know a lot of our uh, viewers and people who, who, you know, I guess work kind of with us, you guys do a lot of in the hoop projects and what, I love the answers, you're it depends, both. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's, that's exactly what I was hoping to see is there is a place for both, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But I will say this one thing, if it is a garment, something you're going to wear, Mm -hmm. that has the ability for you to securely hoop it in a embroidery hoop that's right you'll usually always get better results mm -hmm. you know so i i hope all of you if you can agree with me on that that you know if you can hoop something especially a item that you will wear with apparel uh that has stretchiness to it and all that good stuff then you're always safer to hoop it as opposed to float it yes and with all the tutorials that we're working on you guys will have all of the fabrics. Yeah, actually, yeah. A we've lot been, of the fabrics. Yeah, a, a few of these questions were gauged on what we've been doing the last yeah. week together. So, Jennifer, <laughs> do you have a question? Yes, Dana is asking, when you talk about clicking too much when you digitize, can your clicks be too long? Uh, when you talk about clicking, and I think this is referring to some of the lessons that I've done, right. okay? Uh, when you're clicking in your software, a lot of times when uh, you, and I tell people not to click too much, like mm -hmm. do two click crazy, because yes. if they're zoomed in yes. and they're clicking a lot, most software programs, when you click, especially a uh, left click, which is a straight node, mm -hmm. you're telling the machine to stitch. Yes. Okay. So too many clicks can create too many stitches and hard stitches sometimes. Mm -hmm. And too many hard stitches can create bulletproof embroidery and bird's yeah. nests, right? Yes. But long wise, uh, you don't have to worry usually about how long the space is between the stitches that you're clicking, because if you're using a running stitch, you are usually setting up the stitch length, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if your stitch length is set at two millimeters or three millimeters, and you put one click over here and one click a hundred millimeters away, and you have a two millimeter stitch length, what's going to happen in between? It's going sure. to... Yeah, stitch every two every millimeters. Every two millimeters, yeah. okay? So you don't have to really worry about the dangers of 
how far apart you're you're clicking because it will fill it in based on what you've set as mm -hmm. your default. Yes. Okay. But you do have to worry about how much you're clicking in small areas. And is that even if the minimum is set to let's say point or one millimeter? Uh, yes. And well, see, here's the other thing. And this is what I love about the software in the software, both commercially and home within Wilcom. When you output your designs, there's a small stitch filter. Oh, so yes. it will actually, if you are a crazy clicker, it will try <laughs> its best to help you with that disease. You yes. know what I mean? It'll, it will it'll, remove, it'll all remove the small a lot of the small stuff. Yes. So really, you know, the software will aid you with creating terrible results, mm -hmm. but it is a habit you could avoid getting into in the first place. Yeah. And what people don't realize is the more you click, it takes time to click, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. the less you click, the faster you are. Mm -hmm. The more you click, the slower you are. That's right? right. So yeah, it's just one of those happy mediums. So yeah, awesome. Okay, so we have a couple more things, real quick, guy. Guys, uh, this one is who wants to win? We're going to give away on YouTube uh, and Facebook a couple of uh, <laughs> some designs to a couple of winners. So what should they type in, Jennifer, if they want to win? How about Easter? Happy Easter, because this is Easter weekend. And uh, we're going to be celebrating it big time. Uh, Jennifer and I love Easter for our personal beliefs, but we also love it because our grandkids are here and we get to go. All yeah, kids. all of our kids. Actually, yeah, all of our kids are here with us <laughs> and our grandkids. <laughs> yeah. And, and Ken's here. He's my new kid. So, yeah. So <laughs> I'm adopted. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is great because we are going on an Easter egg hunt on uh, on Sunday. I didn't oh, know if you were so doing much that. Fun. <laughs> I am you have, to, you, have, you have to let the grandkids get the eggs. I don't know about that. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they're all on their own, right? <laughs> okay, so anyways, who wants to win? Type in Easter, Happy Easter, or anything else that is good. And, and here's what we're going to be giving. You guys will get your choice Aww. of either our, uh, I forget what we actually named this pack, but it's like a honeybee pack, which is symbolic of spring because we're almost there. It's around the corner. We're seeing, we're coming out of the snow. So this is one of your, your choices. This one I do love. We just released it. And this is our, uh, do you remember what we called this? It actually is a really cute name, Jen. Uh, summer, it's summertime, summertime fun. Anyways, we had a, a fun name for this, but this is some really fun designs that are summer related obviously and this is you know we all get to go outside and play again so you guys will get your choice and we will let it go for a tiny little bit and then we'll call out the winners in a second but before we do that we do have one thing we're going to do and that is our stitch to win winners uh every month beth deer actually has a contest where if you post any of our designs on social media and i think there's a tagline of stitch to win or something in there that they just have to post with it then you are automatically entered in for a monthly giveaway where we give you uh, one of our memberships to our clubs. So we are going to do our stitch to win right now. And we actually have our spinning wheel here. Ooh. Oh, I know. It's getting pretty high tech, isn't yeah. it? Okay. <laughs> and all the names for this last month, all the names for February are in here. And do you want to do the honor? Well, actually, you'd have to come over me here. So I'll okay. Do it, okay. Tell me when to click. Telepathically. Three, okay. two, one, and go. You're okay, so we're gonna win the stitch to win. Okay, the stitch to win for February is Whoa. all right, Bruce. Awesome. So you stitch, you are the winner this month. Let's go. Yeah, thank you very much. And just so you guys know, get involved in that contest because it is so easy to win, and as you can see, the odds are pretty good. I mean, if you do our stuff, just post it on there so people can see your beautiful work, and you can win a membership to do even more designs. So that is awesome. Okay, do we have some winners, Jennifer or Deer, for the... Yes. Okay. And also share them so we can see them, guys, because yeah, it's just so them. nice to see embroidery. I feel like it just makes my day to see like stitch outs by you guys, so congrats to Bruce. Awesome. The Facebook winner that we have is Marilyn Paso. Marilyn, Marilyn Paso. Paso. So Marilyn Paso, you really, Ooh. yay. You don't have to do anything. We have your name and, or I guess you do have to, they should email in, right? Yes. Okay. So you send us an email at contact at embroiderylegacy.com. Let, Let us know which of the two packs you want, whether you want this one 
which is the summer pack or whether you want the bees pack either one is yours and the youtube winner is the youtube winner is danny uh, and I don't know how to say the last name. Desensne. Danny Desensne. Yeah, D U C H E S N A. Okay, can you pronounce that, Ken? Let me see. Danny. Danny Duches. Duchesne. Duchesne. Okay, so Danny. Danny. Uh, yeah. Duchesne. <laughs> awesome, Duch awesome. So again, <laughs> you send us an email, contact at embroiderylegacy.com, and you can choose the Bumblebees or you can choose the Summer Fun Pack. Uh, either one is yours. And that pretty much uh, ties it up, except for our uh, Easter giveaway. Beth wanted me to mention this because we do have a contest happening right now. If you post any of the stitch outs that you've done with our Easter designs, you can uh, just post them on our site. You can uh, win an occasional Stitcher membership, which will give you even more designs to play with and stitch out. Mm. And our, I think it's like two more days because Easter it ends, but we do have a 51% off sale for all of our Easter designs. And these oh. were just some of the new ones we did but there are lots and lots. I think we have almost 400 Easter designs. Or may wow. maybe not. I think that might have been Valentine. There's a couple hundred for sure. Can I see the one before? Uh, say please. Please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want that. <laughs> okay, yeah. See, and this is where we kind of uh, have a kindred spirit because I'm all about the kind of kooky, crazy, uh, goth uh, designs. So anyways, this one is not everybody's cup of tea, but mm -hmm. apparently it's ours. Yes. So I see awesome. a skull and a bunny. I'm like, yes, yeah, that's I it. want that on my jacket. Okay. And I see I see a chicken holding a knife. You know? <laughs> so anyways, there's all kinds of fun stuff there. That's when you're not nice to the wife. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> okay guys on that note we really really appreciate you joining us if you had fun give us some thumbs up some hearts put it in the comments uh ken and i we had a good time today it was great james yeah. i love you bud i wish you all the best in all your endeavors and i'm gonna keep people posted because i'm a proud dad so yeah so anyways and jennifer maybe we'll get some pop-ins here and there yeah maybe we'll get some pop-ins here and there because uh he might not be working in the family business right now but he's always family and i know that he'll come and stay with us whenever he has the opportunity right james yeah okay <laughs> he's gonna be locked in the studio and being live all day yeah, that's <laughs> to right. make up for it <laughs> any, any any parting words james that i can pass along um proof is in the stitching Oh, the proof is in the stitching. There we go. Well, thank you, guys. We appreciate you all. And anything else, Jennifer, before I sign out? Okay. Uh, no, I mean, we just have our Easter sale. Uh, guys, uh, keep, keep kind of posted, though, with, uh, I guess, what we have going on. Because as we kind of mentioned, yeah, we, uh, we have a newsletter. Sign up for our newsletter. And we do, I'm trying to hide all this now. Let's get rid of this one. There we go. Uh, we do have a lot of stuff coming up in April. So April is a big month where we have some really fun, exciting announcements. And then we have even more stuff coming up in May. So not much happening right this second, but there's lots of great things that we're looking forward to announcing and having to, you know, it's, it's going to be great. We're it's going to be awesome. awesome. We're going to be a busy year, but you guys are going to get a lot of embroidery and digitizing content ahead of us. So, awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank Happy you. Easter. Happy, Happy Easter, Easter, guys. And he has risen. Yeah. Okay. And he, he has risen for those of you who, you know, you, I guess, share the religious side of Easter, the beliefs, then yeah, this is really what it's all about. But I also like uh, Easter egg hunting and chocolate bunnies too. So <laughs> that's uh, awesome. So have a blessed Easter, guys.